Thank you. Um, I really appreciate you inviting us to be here today, and I think this is a really important topic, and it's one of my favorites, uh, probably because I am not a scientist. So these are my opinions, and they're based on available ev evidence, um, and I'm sure that all the people who did the 97% consensus surveys intended to do something that they thought was very important but I think that they've misled the public and I'll show you why I think that. So, so I get to the next slide. Uh, I think you just scroll down or, or yeah, press down. Hit the down arrow. Down arrow, where is it down arrow? Right, right here. Down okay, there we go, okay. There we go. So we're going to review the concept of consensus. What does that actually mean? We're going to discuss terms and definitions like statisticulation. We're going to review the four most cited consensus studies and their statistical breakdown. We are going to explore the psychological themes that are relevant to groupthink. And we're going to have a look at the ethical and economic consequences of statisticulation. So, happy St. Patty's Day. I am wearing a tiny wee bit of green, but uh, we don't need any more green in our lives these days because as the past president of Enron said, Mike, we're a green energy company, but the green stands for money. And, <laughs> and that's partly why the 97% consensus is pushed so much because Generally speaking, people would not agree to have a less reliable power grid, uh, which is more intermittent and far more expensive, unless they thought they were doing something important like saving the planet for their children. So the, these are deeply ingrained thoughts that people have. So uh, let's just have a quick look at me. Why am I doing this? I'm not a scientist. I have some expertise in advertising and marketing. I have studied various aspects of social psychology, though I don't have a degree in that area. I did work at Alberta Environment for a short time in 2005. I was an information officer. And we were stunned when the Sierra Club gave us an F and gave Ontario a B plus because uh, the climate plan at that time, the environmental and climate plan in Alberta was world class and we were first in everything. Uh, we couldn't figure out why Ontario got a B plus. Um, but now we understand why and also we see the economic consequences there. So early on in my working relationship with Friends of Science on climate change, I wondered how it was possible that all these diverse studies kept coming up with 97%, this magic consensus number. If 97% of the scientists agreed, was that science? And also, was it compliance? And also, why 97%? That really bothered me. So, let's have a look at what consensus is. Consensus, these are some definitions. Consensus is a general agreement about something, an idea or opinion that is shared by all the people in a group. That's from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. So, um, when Dr. Roy Spencer gave his testimony to the Senate, the US Senate, he said, you know, what about this 97% consensus? He said, I'm part of that too. And Dr. Spencer does not actually uh, go along with the catastrophic anthropogenic global warming theory. So he said that I'm part of that 97% consensus too because humans must be causing some warming or some effect on the climate. But the question is what? So he's part of a consensus, but consensus is not unanimity. And that's really important. That doesn't mean that everyone agrees about every single thing. It means that people have a general agreement that humans affect climate. So unanimity calls for explicit agreement of all parties. Consensus falls short of that. And climate change, this term is thrown around as if it means only one thing that being human caused climate change. But in fact, the IPCC itself has a very specific definition that it can mean cooling or warming, and it can mean caused by humans or by natural variability or both. So um, 
but climate change you find in most of these studies is used almost exclusively implied, human caused. Now there are other factors as well that need to be delineated in these studies and they never are. Humans have a number of, of causative factors in affecting the environment and climate. CO2 emissions, GHG emissions, land disturbance, water diversion, deforestation. You never hear about anything but CO2 and GHGs. But Roger Pielke Sr. thinks that land disturbance and water diversion are probably more important regionally on climate change than the other factors. And statisticulation. This is one of my favorite words. Uh, it's statistical manipulation. It's a term coined by Daryl Huff in a book that he wrote in 1954. You can actually get a PDF of it online. It's a great little book. He's not a mathematician, but he uh, had a degree in social psychology. And uh, it, it's, that's what we're dealing with here. It's statisticulation. So is there a thing called the scientific consensus? Well, yes. If we look here, we see the code of conduct on being a scientist. This was done in 75, uh, I believe, by a committee on, the, on science and engineering. And um, this was in the United States. And they say that science has progressed through a uniquely productive marriage of human creativity and hard-nosed skepticism of openness to new scientific contributions and persistent questioning of those contributions and the existing scientific consensus. So in this one little block of text, we find the two words, skepticism and consensus, and that they actually go together, that they're part of scientific inquiry, and this is part of the scientific code of conduct. So obviously, science progresses to a certain state where there is some kind of general agreement on things. And then what happens is other scientists working in other fields, perhaps, bring forward their skepticism and say, hey, what we all thought last year seems to be a bit different this year because we learned more things. So if we go to the next, we find that in that same booklet, science results in knowledge that is often presented as being fixed and universal, like the science is settled. Scientific results, though, are inherently provisional. Science, scientists can never prove conclusively that they've described some aspect of the natural or physical world with complete accuracy. So in that sense, all scientific results must be treated as susceptible to error. So, so why is consensus such a big deal in the global warming, climate change discussions? Because consensus is very influential. And here we have the past president of the US stating that 97% of scientists agree climate change is real, man-made, and dangerous. And he quotes one of the uh, Cook studies there, I believe. Anyway, um, so why the 97% figure? What kind of scientists are they? What do they agree on? Who says so? And so we investigated it. So Friends of Science did a review of the major consensus studies. Oreskes, 2004, Doran and Zimmerman, 2009, Anderegg et al, 2010, Cook et al, 2013. Now there are more studies out there, but uh, those are the ones that we reviewed. So, <laughs> the down button, <laughs> yeah. So this is our report. It's posted on our website, on the home page. If you just scroll down below Dr. Uh, Nir Shaviv's uh, video clip, you'll find it there. And we called it 97% consensus? No, global warming math myths and social proofs. So if we go down. The first one we looked at was Oreskes, 2004. And she's probably the one that started all this. Um, it originated as part of a speech that she gave to a banquet, and the people were quite interested. She says in one of her YouTube videos, people came up to her after and said, is that really true? Is it true that 97% agree? So it showed up later as an article in Science Magazine, part of which you see here. and. Um, this was published, by the way, about four days before a major international climate conference. How convenient. And um, 
it was not peer reviewed at the time. I've read someplace that it has been since peer reviewed, but it was not. It was just an article, although it's always cited as if it is a peer reviewed study. So, Roger Pielke Jr., whoop, we went too far. Who's, it is? Can you uh, go back then? Yeah, can you go back there? Okay, just go down one. Okay, now go down two. Okay, good. So Roger Pielke Jr. challenged Oreskes. He wrote a rebuttal in the same publication, in, but it was published in 2005, just after. And um, he said that our policies should not be optimized to reflect a single measure of the central tendency, but they should be robust enough to accommodate the distribution of perspectives, because we might learn more in the future. So that was a very reasoned thing. Uh, and Oreskes responded to him kind of bluntly by saying, Pielke's right in understanding the results of scientific research does not implicate us in any particular course of action. And the purpose of my essay was not to advocate either for or against the Kyoto Accords or any other particular policy response. A full debate on the moral, social, political, ethical, and economic ramifications of possible responses to climate change, as well as the ramifications of inaction action would be a very good thing. Oh, could you just go back? But such a debate is impeded by climate change deniers, if you can believe it. Of all the people who I, uh, I observe, Nomi Oreskes is one of the people impeding that debate. Do you go back? Oops. It's very sensitive, I guess. So on her CV, it's also important to note that at that time, uh, Oreskes was, Nomi Oreskes was a member of the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council Committee on the use of models in regulatory decision making. And she was on that panel from 2004 to 2007. And the interesting thing is that in that time period of 2004, many scientists in the world were already observing that there was quite a divergence between the projections of warming by the IPCC and the actual observed temperatures. In fact, by 2006, the late Bob Carter was writing op-eds saying, it's cooling, it's not warming anymore. So um, it looks like perhaps a bit of job protection happening there. <laughs> So, but consensus gained a life of its own when a rescue study showed up in Al Gore's movie. So Al claimed that of 928, zero scientists disagreed with uh, anthropogenic global warming. But uh, Benny Pizer, who's with the Global, Policy, global Warming Policy Foundation in the UK, he reran Oreskes' work using the same terms. And uh, there were a few more papers because he did his work a bit later. So I think his work had about 1,100 papers or so. And he found that actually only 13 scientists explicitly endorsed the catastrophic view. So this is a very important separation about the global warming consensus. How many scientists actually support the catastrophic view? How many? implicitly endorse that this might happen, but they focus more on the impacts. So we can see that 13 explicitly endorsed, 322 implicitly endorsed, but they were focused in their papers on the impacts. Um, we find that 67 were focused on methods of analysis. Um, 87 were focused on paleo climate analysis, so that's in the historic past. And 34 absolutely rejected or doubted the consensus. 44 were focused on natural factors of climate change. And 470 had no position whatsoever. They just mentioned the term climate change or global climate change in their paper. So people were very misled, and yet you see the headline of An Inconvenient Truth. Um, it's the most terrifying movie you'll ever see in your life. So people were scared. And of course, if you show them that a thousand scientists all agree, and in fact, Oreskes' paper never said that either. She said that 75 seemed to show agreement, and 25 showed no disagreement, but that doesn't mean they agreed. Anyway, and we show that Pizer shows that very, very few people 
actually explicitly have a, ca a catastrophic view. So. Michelle, is that slide available on the website? Uh, that one? Uh, we tweet it from time to time. It's a composite that we made. So if, if you want it, you can get it from us. Okay, so now we go to Doran and Zimmerman. This one's also very highly quoted, frequently quoted. They did this in 2009, and it was based on Margaret Kendall Zimmerman's MA thesis, which was called The Consensus on the Consensus, which you see in the green there. And you can actually download that from Lulu online for $2. I, I recommend it because it's really important to read the detail. Um, this, the actual paper that she did with Peter Doran, who was her um, thesis supervisor, was published in EOS of the American Geophysical Union. So that's a very important paper. And they said that the objective of our study presented here is to assess the scientific consensus on climate change through an unbiased survey of a large and broad group of Earth scientists. So let's, let's see how that, that came out. So they began with a pool of 10,257 Earth scientists. That's a lot of people. Those are, you know, geophysicists, geologists. And of those, 3,146 responded. <coughs> That's also a very substantial base. But of those, only 79 self-selected themselves, said, I've mostly been publishing on climate. And so those were the people who were chosen to be the pool of 100%. So fundamentally, the respondents answered two opinion questions. One, when compared with pre, oh, that's, sorry, there's a typo there, pre-1800 levels, do you think that the mean global temperatures have generally risen, fallen, or remained relatively constant? So if you ask a geologist this, they probably could say that it's actually fallen because overall the Earth is in a cooling phase. And when you um, talk about generally risen or fallen, well, is 0 0.08 degrees risen? Because that's within the margin of error. And uh, the second one, do you think human activity is a significant contributing factor in changing mean global temperatures? So what's missing in these two questions? empirical parameters. The IPCC does not make their statements based on opinions. They make them based on specific parameters that humans are causing X amount since this time and it's going to have this kind of effect and this is how certain we are. So this is kind of a very fishy 97% um, consensus survey. And uh, so they came to the conclusion that it seems that the debate on the authenticity of global warming and the role played by human activity is largely non-existent among those who understand the nuances and scientific basis of long-term climate processes. The challenge, rather, appears how to, to be effectively communicate this fact to policymakers and a public that continues to mistakenly perceive debate among scientists. Nuances? Well, let's just look at some of the original database responses. If you go to her original thesis, you will find, this is, these are ones that I just drew from it. There are here 38 scientists who wrote in and said it's the sun that drives climate. And humans, you can see five of them had a, a reference to humans having a nominal effect. One person said it's the humans. <coughs> So these are 38 objectors. If you read all of, she, she did a good thing. She included all the emails that she got. She had dozens of emails berating her for the opinion nature of the questions, saying, I can't even respond to your survey because you're asking me opinions. I'm a scientist. I'm not gonna ask, you know, answer that. Um, and so let's look at the facts here. So technically, 97% agree with the two opinion questions because when you take those 79 people, uh, 77 agreed with one question and 76 agreed with the other. But you know, if you look at the full body of people who were asked, 7,111 um, uh, didn't even respond. Of the 3,000 that responded, you find that you know, only uh, 
two answered no, but you have this little bubble of 79 people. So that's not all the world's scientists. That's not representative. And what did uh, Ms. Zimmerman actually think? Well, in her, uh, in her MA thesis, she actually says, it's challenging to keep our own biases in check when conducting a survey like this. When I said we have such a clear idea of what we are asking, I meant that we've been over and over many versions of the same questions, looking for the most neutral wording so it becomes difficult to look at each question through fresh eyes and see where the issues might be. And then she says, this entire process has been an exercise in re-educating myself about the climate debate. And in the process, I can honestly say that I've heard very convincing arguments from all the different sides. And I think I'm actually more neutral on the issue now than I was before I started the project. There's so much gray area when you begin to mix science and politics, environmental issues and social issues, calculated rational thinking with emotions. I, that just blew me away when I read that because I previously read the, the published work and yet here she was saying that she's actually quite neutral on it. Yet it's presented in the published work as if there is a 97% consensus. The next one is Andereg et al. And uh, Andereg was actually a student at the time. He had his work published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which is a very, very prestigious science journal. And that happened because one of his um, uh, I think it was his thesis supervisor, was Stephen Schneider. And Schneider was one of the key people in the climate change movement at the time. He's since passed away, but um, he was also a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And at the time, they had this category called contributed articles. And you can see here that this is contributed by Stephen H. Schneider. So what that means is that if you were a member of the National Academy of Sciences, you had the right to contribute four times a year, kind of a science op-ed where you could be part of the design of the research, but you didn't actually have to do the research. And you could ask two of your buddies to review it. They had to be qualified in the field, but you could ask them to review it. If they said it was okay, it was submitted and published. So by contrast, when the PNAS publishes a peer-reviewed item, they have the person submit it blind with no identifying marks. The editorial committee chooses between five and eight anonymous qualified reviewers, and that's how it's peer-reviewed. So you can see that this is what people would call a PAL review. However, it got very high profile. Now, they wanted to, um, uh, oh, sorry, could we go to the next one? They wanted to establish credibility of those who critique climate. So uh, they went through the IPC list and they, IPCC list of scientists, and I think that they assumed that probably everybody would be on board. And they were surprised to find out that uh, about 34% of the IPCC scientists themselves do not agree with the IPCC catastrophic view. And if we could go to the next one. And so they said, well, how, do, how can we get this to 97? Oh, I know. We'll see how many uh, of these people are the most published and the most cited. <coughs> so of course, you may have heard of Climate Gate and some of these other things. There seems to be or have been kind of a click as to who gets published and who doesn't. And I'm certainly Ms. Uh, Dr. Schneider being one of the top guys, and he actually started one of the climate change magazines or journals. Um, most of the people who uh, were deemed to be the most qualified were also the most cited, but they're also the most published because they tend to follow the party line. And then we come to Cook et al. So Cook is widely cited. This one is probably the most cited, and he's got these cute little graphics that look just like Pac-Man, right? So it's a very strong image. And uh, their definition was extremely loose. It was humans cause warming. So, you know, that's kind of like saying, you know, fleas cause spring. I don't know, they show up in the spring, so, okay. Uh, you know, it's a very loose definition, it has nothing to do with actual consensus. And in fact, this was broken down by Legates, and they found that 
76% of the people surveyed had no position on anthropogenic warming. Only 0.5% actually endorsed anthropogenic global warming as at 50% cost. And many of the authors reviewed actually publicly objected to how Cook categorized their work. So there are big problems with that one too. So it's not a consensus survey that um, should be believed. So this is a table that we did um, based on our report. And it, it's kind of a simple way to look at things. Uh, one of the things that we know when you're comparing them all, they all use a different search term. So uh, Oreski said she used climate change. Ultimately, she changed it and said, oops, I meant global climate change. Pizer used global climate change. Dora and Zimmerman used the two opinions. Um, Andrew Eggett went by publication. And Cook used global climate change or global warming. So when you go through our report, you'll see that we've tracked down all of the different details and tried to define the parameters. All the parameters are different in all of these studies. So it doesn't make sense that it can continuously come up with a common 97% consensus when there's actually no commonality between the parameters. And in our review, we found that based on Pizer's review of Oreskes, actually only 1.2% explicitly agreed with the IPCC declaration, and that's from a base number of about 1,000 respondents. Doran and Zimmerman, only 2.38% out of the 346 respondents agreed with AGW. Andrea Gadel, 66% did agree with it, but those are all IPCC scientists. And Cook, only 0.54% out of 11,944. So, when you're talking with people and they say there's a 97% consensus, ask them on what? What's it on? So this is from um, the book that I mentioned earlier, How to Lie with Statistics. This is what Daryl Huff called statisticulation. Misinforming people by the use of statistical material might be called statistical manipulation, in a word, statisticulation. Percentages office offer a fertile field for confusion because they lend an aura of precision to the inexact. And any percentage figure based on a small number of cases is likely to be misleading. Now, we've also gone after NASA because they constantly put the 97% on their site. And uh, we asked them to, to change that because uh, in the United States, I think, the United States alone, there's something like 2.4 million scientists and technical people, and they've never ever been surveyed. So it's, it's embarrassing that NASA supports it. But we see how influential it is. Here we have Physics Org publishing uh, this claim that all of these studies, and they claim here bringing together authors of seven different consensus studies, they show that among climate experts, the rate of agreement about human-caused change, climate change is 90 to 100%. In the Carlton study, none of these people are climate experts. They're all uh, like biology people. <laughs> they may be able to see some effects on climate change in terms of uh, animal life or plant life or something, but they're not climate scientists. Um, so, um, you know, this is very, very misleading, and you can see that it gets to the upper echelon. We've seen that Barack Obama said it, and our own premier said, friends, climate change is real, is caused by human activity, and we see here the IPCC says, that's not so. Climate change refers to any change in climate over time, whether due to natural variability or as a result of human activity or both. So, why is this happening if, if what I say is true? Well, groupthink and herd mentality are driving this conversation, and the 97% figure is no accident. How am I doing time-wise? We're doing pretty good. We've got another 10 minutes, and then we actually have, we actually have 45 minutes for question and okay. after your time. Right. So you have about 10 Great. minutes and maybe 15 minutes. Okay, well, there's a thing called the Ash Conformity Experiment, and this was done in the 50s, and they actually can't do this kind of thing anymore because um, of ethics considerations. But in fact, we are all living in an Ash Conformity Experiment. So um, this uh, experimenter, Solomon Ash, 
found that humans are highly compliant. They're herd mentality beings who are easily swayed by apparent majority views, especially by role dominant experts. So a role dominant expert is like a doctor or a lawyer or a politician, someone who we look up to for wisdom and special knowledge. Um, you know, and I, like let, let's think of this as if it were a doctor setting. Let's imagine, heaven forbid, you know, you have some kind of medical issue, you're not sure what's up. So you go to a clinic, the nurse takes all your details, you meet with a few doctors, the nurse goes away and then comes back and says, well, 97% of the doctors think you should have an operation. <laughs> you know, but actually one of those doctors said, well, I don't think it's a problem yet. We should leave it. Maybe it'll go away by itself. <laughs> you know, another doctor said, well, you know, I need more money for my clinic and I want to do more of this kind of surgery. So I think they definitely should have it. So, and everything in between. So. Humans are swayed by that because, you know, if a doctor told you something like that, it, that's why they say get a second opinion sometime, because that ensures that you're getting a, a fair advice on a condition. But no one is getting second opinions here on the 97%. <laughs> so Ash did this experiment where he um, brought in uh, about a group of four people he had a number of lines on the, on the wall, vertical lines, and it was quite obvious which lines matched in size. But the four people that he brought in, he asked them to give the wrong answer. Then he brought in a stranger, volunteer, and so he's going down the list and saying, well, which of these matches the other line? And all of them give the wrong answer. When it gets to the stranger, that person goes along with them, you know, because they feel overwhelmed by the power of the group in the room. And this um, only changed when they brought in yet another person who would agree with the dissenting view, or also when they asked the people to write it down. When they wrote it down, it dropped to like 33% agreement. So it, this is why it's so important that if you disagree, speak up. You know, and try and explain some of the things that I've explained to you today, because that will help people find the courage to express their own concerns. So humans are very strongly averse to rejection or exclusion. This is why it's a 97% figure. If we had these studies published and people were saying, well, of 79 scientists, 77 agreed on two opinion questions out of a pool of 10,000, I'm sure most of you would go, that's baloney, that's ridiculous. But because they state it as a 97%, who wants to be that 3%? Who wants to be the odd man out? You do? Okay. Well, obviously everyone in this room, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> um, consequently, the claim that a statistical majority of nearly 100% role-dominant expert individuals like scientists agree to a sweeping statement about climate change, it's very effective in swaying public opinion even when the evidence argues against the consensus claim. So this can be seen online. I tried to load it up, but I don't think I succeeded, so let's not mess it up. Um, so there's another fellow named Cialdini, and Robert Cialdini is an expert on influence. He wrote a book called Influence, in also like in around the 50s, 60s. And he found that, that um, in advertising, the easiest way to sell something is to tell people that everybody's buying it called bandwagoning. So, you know, you see that trending on Twitter. You see people saying, oh, boycott Ivanka, or, you know, buy Ivanka. So these are pitches to try and get people to bandwagon, and the more that people get on the bandwagon, the more people get on the bandwagon. But he was very condemnatory of the misuse of bandwagoning. And he said, we, own, we need only to make a conscious choice to be alert to counterfeit social evidence. We can relax until the exploiter's evident fakery is spotted, at which time we should pounce. And he thought that it was terrible that people misused this because it is such a powerful tool. He said, we should pounce with a vengeance. I'm speaking of more than simply ignoring misinformation, though this defensive tactic is certainly called for. I'm speaking of aggressive counterattack. Whenever possible, we ought to sting those responsible for rigging the social evidence. 
And um, regarding ostracization, there are a number of experiments that Kipling D. Williams did about ostracizing people. And he expresses the outcome of being ostracized or excluded as the 3% as this, the kiss of social death. And we at Friends of Science have a person in our uh, former group, our past um, scientific advisor, Sally Baliunas. She was an astrophysicist uh, in the United States at Harvard Wilson Observatory. And she was actually drummed right out of the science world because she got death threats, she got berated, she got told she was funded by big oil, and on and on and on. She was an excellent scientist and just driven right out of the field. And we see also Dr. Judith Curry recently has re retired from Georgia Tech. And she said, you know, having a dissenting view in this issue is like walking down the hall with knives in your back. So um, that's what's happening, and that's why people have been afraid to speak up, actually, until recently with uh, the election of President Trump, you know, it's been very difficult to have any dissenting view. Oh, thank you so much. So anyway, th throughout the consensus paper, there are persistent pejorative references to those who challenge or dissent with the alleged consensus. The familiar terms of contrarian, denier, conspiracy theorist, manufacturers of doubt are dotted throughout their research papers. And indeed, Stefan Lewandowski, he's the guy who wrote Nassau Fate the Moon Landing. His 2010 paper, despite a single reference to legitimate skepticism, whatever that is, he doesn't define it, in some quarters, he successfully and publicly tarred all potential climate change consensus challenger with the brush of conspiracy theorists simply through his much cited inflammatory title. So anyone who says, I disagree, people say, oh, you probably also think NASA faked the moon landing. That comes from Lewandowski. And Lewandowski is not a climate scientist, he's a social psychologist. So he knows very well what those tools are and how they're being used inappropriately against people. And uh, we actually complained to the Committee on Publication Ethics about the use of that term in his title. We didn't get very far, but we got that information out there. So I call them merchants of consensus. And I hope one day to write a book on this. I haven't done it yet. Here you see uh, all the climate models. And here's an average, the dark line. The models go up. And uh, here you can see that since about 2000, temperatures have flatlined. And you can see how consensus studies have proliferated despite contrary evidence. So 2004 was Oreskes. 2007, she wrote another one called The Scientific Consensus on Climate Change. How do we know we're not wrong? <laughs> Doran and Zimmern, 2009. Andreg, 2010. Um, Lewandowski, 2013, Cook et al., quantifying the consensus. So, um, you know, it doesn't really look to me like it's warming, but uh, I guess the consensus says that it is and they're right. <coughs> so what are the ethical dimensions of this? That, like, people might say, oh, well, you know, so people were wrong or people are supporting their own point of view. What does it matter? Well, we kind of know what it matters. First of all, humans have four ultimate concerns. Death, freedom, isolation, and meaninglessness. This is according to the psychologist Yalom. So climate change is an existential threat, or that's how it's been framed, and it neatly fits into all of these. This is why people are so taken aback when you try to challenge them, or um, when you say that you know you just disagree or you don't think it'll be that catastrophic, they are terrified because they have fallen into these uh, common human needs, psychological needs, and they have found meaning in climate change. Look at what people do. They go to climate change meetings, they recycle their garbage. They, there's lots of rituals that have been transferred into climate change and environmental issues that people do that give them meaning. Like when people say, I want a bike lane because I'm going to bike to work and reduce the GHGs in Calgary. They actually expect that all of us will be biking to work. You know, this is a huge city. I mean, I have a friend who lives way up in the north whose kids are in soccer and band and, you know, this person is doing rounds of the city every day. They're not going to be doing it on a bike. <laughs> So, um, 
And, and you know, climate change, it's easy to light that catastrophic fire because it's written in our history. Noah's Ark, um, even actually the two best stage love musicals, best love stage musicals, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat and Les Miserables are both set on a backdrop of climate catastrophe. Joseph is set in the famine in Egypt and Les Miserables is set in the later part of the Little Ice Age when there was tremendous social revolt in France. There'd been five years of rain at the beginning of the Little Ice Age and there'd been famine across the land. So it's really easy to trigger people on those fears. So to ensure fair, oh, okay, that's all right. Anyway, because we don't, re because none of these studies reference the natural influence or the uncertainties, this creates false and misleading public perception that humans are solely responsible. And once you make people feel guilty, they also become very compliant. It's another psychological factor. So, so the ethics and economics, thus those who are swayed by Cook, by the claims of consensus should be aware of the cautionary review by IPCC lead author and economist Richard Toll who noted that a century of climate change is not worse than losing a decade of economic growth. Those are the economic impacts of implementing these crazy climate policies that are destroying our economy. And he's a lead author of um, the climate impacts and mitigations. So he's quite knowledgeable. So what I say to you is 97% consensus? No, there's no consensus. They're not even close. They are fooling you. And here's our ad that we won a gold award for. <laughs> but actually when we ran that ad, um, we had a problem with one of our suppliers because they were just being ripped apart on social media for running that ad. So vehement response. Anyway, and um, that's why it's important to keep speaking up because we have to have a civil informed debate on this issue and not just go along with groupthink. So I thank you all.